Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. You're listening to a special symposium episode of the show focused on financial and corporate regulation in the Biden administration. As part of this symposium, we'll hear from five panels of scholars and practitioners about what we might expect for financial and corporate regulation over the next four years of the Biden-Harris administration. We'll return with our regular episodes next week. As usual, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app. We'll let others know about the show, too. Welcome to the third episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast Symposium on Corporate and Financial Regulation in the Biden Administration. This panel focuses on consumer protection and finance, and it features Christopher Odenay, Nitsan Packin, and Spencer Williams. Chris, Nitsan, Spencer, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you. Yeah, nice to be here. Thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to hearing some of your insights about uh, consumer protection and finance over the next four years in just a few moments. But I wondered if before we begin, if you might be able to introduce yourselves and any areas or issues that you're focused on in this panel and as we look toward the next four years of the Biden administration. Chris? Sure. um, I'm happy to start. So I have focused for the past several years uh, first on the regulation of mortgage servicers and then more recently the regulation of non-bank financial companies in the consumer finance space that are typically known as financial technology or fintech companies. The first part of my work really involved consumer-facing problems with the way mortgage servicers, the sort of mortgage intermediaries in the residential mortgage securitization system in the United States handle stress and handle economic downturns and wide ranging defaults, which we saw after 2008. And, you know, I hope we won't see, but we've already started to see some cracks in the system since COVID. And that culminated in a book with Cambridge Press in 2019. And then my more recent work, um, as I mentioned, has been around fintech firms, uh, essentially the firms that offer different types of unsecured consumer loans, as well as the firms that serve as money transmitting businesses. So that's sort of uh, where my focus has been. And, and I'll chat a little bit about where I think the new administration will go in those spaces, or I hope they will. All right. Thank you. Nitsan? So I'm a business law professor at Baruch College at the Zikling School of Business at, um, at City University of New York. And I've been focusing a lot on questions that relate to banking and technology. So a lot of uh, the fintech issues that have been on my mind relate to trustworthiness and credit scoring of individuals and all sorts of alternative banking systems. As a result, also artificial intelligence, AI uh, systems, and how those uh, play out for consumers in the different banking services and alternative banking systems, as well as reg tech, regulatory technology, and some of the uh, cybersecurity implications of all of this. And recently, I've very much engaged and focused on consumer financial data sharing and how the relationship between banks and financial technology companies, in particular, the data aggregators that connect the two come into play and how that impacts the American consumers and how we fare out in comparison to um, consumers in the EU and Australia and other parts of the world with regards to uh, consumer financial data sharing. Thank you. And Spencer? Thanks, Andrew. I'm an associate professor at Golden Gate University School of Law, and I focus on contracts and how contracts can be modeled as complex systems, um, interconnected complex systems, and how contracts intersect with information technology. So in the area related to consumer protection, recently I've been looking into both algorithmic price gouging and also consumer data protection in the context of consumer contracts with online sellers. So I'm looking forward to talking about how some of these ideas might be implemented in a Biden administration. Thank you all. And I'm excited to hear about some of these topics and and some of this discussion. I wonder if we could start the conversation with a little bit of a backward looking question. This is an inherently forward looking symposium, of course, but we'd like to look backward maybe four years or eight years or 12 years even. What are some missed opportunities or mistakes that you've seen from the current administration, the Trump administration or the Obama administration before it, perhaps, when it comes to consumer protection and finance? And are there any opportunities that you see there for the future? Chris? 
Sure. So I actually want to start this answer. Oh, and I guess I, I forgot in my wind up, I'm on the faculty at the University of Iowa College of Law, uh, which I suppose is important to say. An area that I think where there was a lot of missed opportunity and that missed opportunity has just continued and in some ways made worse under the Trump administration. And, and that is to go back to the Obama administration. There are two areas where I think uh, or where I focused on, but, but, but I really think these are glaring areas of neglect from post-2008 financial reform. And those two areas first are the regulation of non-bank financial institutions. So by and large, the biggest way, there's some smaller things, but really the biggest, most significant move that post-2008 financial reform made in the non-bank space was to create the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC. Um, And part of its charge was to look at non-bank financial institutions that had the potential to pose a systemic risk to the economy and to designate them as such, and then thereby placing them under the regulation and supervision of the Federal Reserve. So, you know, there are problems with that, you know, I've got to put that to the side as to how that has actually played out. But one thing that was never addressed were just non-banks more broadly. And and I'll really say uh, non-bank firms that increasingly are providing a larger share of the financial products and services to the American public, particularly sort of middle income, lower middle income and lower income Americans who don't find or don't find adequate service from the incumbent banking system. And right now, we are seeing various instances of regulatory arbitrage where these sorts of firms who generally are subject to a patchwork quilt of different types of regulatory schemes at the federal and the state level are able to kind of slide around some of these structures or else partner with depository institutions to avoid certain types of consumer financial regulations. And so while that is a missed opportunity from 2008, I think that it has only grown relatedly uh, grown grown as a problem. One area that was a missed opportunity and continues to be a missed opportunity over the past administration is what to do with the secondary mortgage market. We really did not do anything significant with the, in solving the ultimate problems of the secondary mortgage market other than placing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a conservatorship that was supposed to only be temporary but has now gone on for well over you know over a decade. A little bit of that I think is forgivable. I think no one can really no one really knows what they want to do with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is to say no one really can agree exactly on how robust a role the federal government should have in the housing market. But you know, leaving those enormous financial institutions, which now dominate the housing market, some, you know, 70 some odd plus percent of all mortgage originations are securitized by Fannie and Freddie. And the weakness of the servicing sector, which has now, you know, been driven largely to the non-bank firms is really showing cracks in this age of COVID where we have such large scale forbearances in loan payments and perhaps more to come. So those are sort of the big two areas that I'm interested in that I think were left unaddressed over the last administration and this one. Thank you. Nitsan? So I couldn't agree more with Chris. I mean, I think that that's exactly right. And and I think that part of the issue was that following the 2008 financial crisis, for various reasons and a lot of anti-bank resentment kind of feelings, we saw slowly the growth of the fintech sector and in various directions. And, you know, these fintech companies uh, focus their efforts on on different types of services, essentially almost all, you know, banking services with the inclusion of deposits when they partner with other banks, as Chris pointed out. And I think that, you know, this growth, which enjoyed the regulatory arbitrage that Chris mentioned, has really sort of boomed during the pandemic now because of, you know, the shelter at place orders and and work from home. And so people really needed to rely on digital banking. And while, you know, there have been, you know, some regulatory requirements, obviously, that, you know, these institutions and entities need to comply with, there has been a missed opportunity in trying to better manage this. And some of the things are, 
more specific to the type of service. Like, for example, in the EU, we have the payment service directive, the second one that, you know, the PSD2 that regulates some of these issues with regards to payments and data sharing as those, you know, relate to payments. And the GDPR is helpful as well. But in the US, we haven't seen such regulation, with the exception of California and the CCPL, although it does not cover certain, you know, many of the financial aspects that we're focused on. And so I think one of the missed opportunities is also the fact that there is no, you know, single U.S. cybersecurity law or any type of, you know, general regulation beyond just, you know, restrictions of unfair trade practices or things like that that are also relevant when we talk about data and, and data portability and sharing of data, which are all extremely relevant when we talk about these new digital players and these new financial technology entities. And that's another missed opportunity. Another thing is more regulation and more scrutiny in terms of how do we better manage the financial inclusion aspects of financial technology companies, which is great. That's one of the bigger advantages, as Chris pointed out. You know, these companies are better suited to reach different niche clientele and smaller, you know, sectorial types of groups. But at the same time, we need to very carefully make sure and monitor that they're not discriminating in any way. And and so, for example, New York State has recently passed at the end of 2019, a legislation that prohibits consumer reporting agencies and lenders from using certain information to determine an individual's credit worthiness, things like that. I would really love to see more form and take place in other states, if not nationally in in a federal legislation. And I think these are, are missed opportunities, but it's not too late. Thank you. And Spencer? I largely see two big missed opportunities. And the first is going to build on a lot of what Nitsan was just talking about. And that's with respect to the complete lack of federal leadership on data protection, particularly consumer data protection. And in the context of consumer contracting, the kind of wild west of the freedom of use of consumer data has allowed a lot of online sellers and online companies to do kind of a frightening degree of both price discrimination and term discrimination in consumer contracting. And so it would be really great to start to see progress on some sort of federal data protection regulation. And as Nietzsche mentioned, you know, the great classic example here is the GDPR from Europe. And so that's kind of one big missed opportunity. And then the second is more recent and that's just the, the very weak response to price gouging in the wake of COVID and some other recent kind of large scale disasters like the Western wildfires. Uh, historically, you know, price gouging has been left to the states and you know a variety of states have different price gouging regulations. Some have none, but the federal government just has chosen not to play a role here. And in the wake of COVID and some of these other disasters, we saw just very serious price gouging, particularly occurring on online platforms such as Amazon. So you would see, you know, um, hand sanitizer going for like 800% more than it was just like a few days prior in the early days of COVID. And this has been made all the worse by the fact that so much of online pricing at this point for consumer products and consumer services is no longer done by humans. It's done by algorithmic dynamic pricing algorithms. And so the the fact that, you know, in the wake of COVID, these algorithms basically just like push the price of all these necessary goods and services up to kind of dramatic levels really is an example of just how much of a failure the current patchwork of price gouging regulation is. So going into a Biden administration, um, I'm definitely looking for some federal action in that area. That's a little bit of a look back over the last four years, eight years, 12 years, and maybe looking forward, you know, we are recording this conversation on the 11th of December, 2020. And so some of the shape of the next administration is a little bit unclear in terms of the personnel, the shape of Congress and control of Congress is up in the air. But to the extent that we can, I wondered if you could maybe discuss some predictions or perhaps hopes for the next four years in some of these areas. What do you see coming down the pike, perhaps? Chris? A couple of things. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of this really depends upon who is at the head of a particular federal financial regulator. You know, for sure, 
the Federal Reserve will, at least until I think February of 2022, be headed by Jerome Powell, because that's how long his chairmanship of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors lasts. There are technically two seats on the board, two governorships that are open, but President Trump has appointed two individuals. Those have not yet made it through Senate confirmation, but they do await Senate confirmation, and there is still time. So that would leave President Biden with no appointments to the Federal Reserve. Although, you know, seemingly Jerome Powell, uh, his temperament suggests that some of his policy positions would be in line with what we think a Biden administration would want to do. Although there's some concerns about the Fed's supervision of banks uh, that I'll put to the side. When it comes to consumer protection, I think we'll totally see a major turnaround because ever since the Supreme Court recently decided the Cilia Law case. We know that the Senate confirmed director of the Bureau, Kathy Craninger, is now freely removable by the president. And I anticipate that she either will be removed very shortly after President Biden is sworn in or, or perhaps she will resign and a person will be replaced that has a much more aggressive consumer oriented ethos than what I think she has exhibited. So from, from that perspective, I think we'll certainly see a change. Also, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, so the major, very important federal banking regulator. Right now, Brian Brooks is in an acting position there. And so the president will be able to install a Senate confirmed new comptroller as well. And, you know, President Trump has recently nominated formally Brian Brooks to that position. But if the Celia Law case is any indication, of the status of sort of non-removable agency heads like the comptroller, then perhaps he'll be able to dismiss that person as well. Lastly, the FDIC seats. Jelena McWilliams appears to want to stay through the end of her term. So I say all that to say that what the Biden administration will be able to do regulatorily will be a little different depending upon which regulator you're talking about, which sort of prudential context, which sort of entity we're talking about. What I do hope comes out of this in the fintech space, and I'm sure Nietzsche has some thoughts on this as well, the last few comptrollers, including the final one under the Obama administration, had been proponents of a national non-bank charter that essentially could be given to financial technology companies. Now, the one that has been sort of most popularized and has been the most controversy about has been one that would not allow for deposit taking, but to sort of like think of it as more perhaps a lending one or or I guess suppose a payments one. You know, the Trump administration rolled this out. Odding rolled this out when he was comptroller, but they did it in this incredibly antagonistic way with the states, which of course resulted in litigation from the states, probably most famously from the Conference of State Banking Supervisors in the New York Department of Financial Services. I don't think it needed to be this way. I think that there is a way to do a fintech charter right, and that is by bringing the state regulators to the table, addressing the consumer concerns particularly when it comes to lending. And the big issue is usury. And I really hope that the Biden administration, the comptroller and others get together and really address the pluses and the minuses and try and iron out something that can make many of the constituents feel happy with what could be some sort of nationwide non-bank consumer finance charter that protects consumers and provides, you know, safety and soundness to these institutions in the system, but also makes it more feasible for these companies to do business and to offer the types of products and services that they say that they do on terms that are affordable. Thank you. Nitsan. So I also agree that there should be a way to do this right. And I think I'm concerned about the same things that Chris is. And I feel like this would definitely be on the agenda because there's just a lot of pressure, too much pressure, and and we need to figure out a a workable solution because we already needed one several years ago. I also think that another issue that has been really building up is consumer financial data issue, whether banks and financial technology companies can share it or not. Just in the last two months, we've seen two major developments. The first was recently when the DOJ has blocked 
Visa from purchasing the biggest data aggregator out there because of holistic considerations. And basically, this would have an impact on the ability of financial technology companies and banks to share the data and major consequences on that aspect. While at the same time, the CFPB a month ago has issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to solicit opinions about how to regulate this issue, how to uh, implement Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act, a section that was long forgotten and for a decade there, no one really paid close attention to, but really determines the right of consumers and entities to share consumers' financial data. And we'll have to figure out if consumers have the ability to manage their own financial data or not. This is something that we see happening over the world. There's a new Australian law that talks about consumers' right to manage all of their data, not just financial data, across industry and even with entities from abroad that want to share and get you know, information in return. And so this is something that has to happen in the next year or two as well. And last but not least, I think that the lack of the national single federal law that regulates information security and cybersecurity and privacy throughout the country, I mean, it, it's long needed and we have seen multiple attempts to pass such an act, but I think this is something that will probably be on regulators' radar screen and will happen in in this period, I think, of the Biden-Harris administration. Thank you. And Spencer? So my two hopes go back to the issues that I raised in the previous question. And the first one, I'm just going to pick up kind of right where Nietzsche just left off, which is I would love to see a federal privacy and data protection uh, regulation, basically a U.S. version of GDPR, uh, though, you know, taking into account and, and learning from some of the shortfalls of GDPR in the past couple of years. This is, you know, one of the interesting areas where even though we're an incredibly divided political climate, this seems to be one of the areas where there is actually some bipartisan support. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that big tech companies are not exactly the most popular entities in the country right now. And so I think we're seeing support on, you know, both the Democratic and Republican sides for some sort of federal regulation to start putting some limits on the use of consumer data. The second hope is, you know, a a little smaller in scope, but nonetheless is something I think is really important. And that's is a, a federal price gouging law. As I mentioned before, right now price gouging is handled at the state level, but unfortunately a lot of the state price gouging laws were written in a time when pricing was still primarily done by humans rather than by algorithms. And secondly, a lot of these laws were written in a time when disasters and crises and emergencies were fairly regional in nature. So if there were a tornado or a fire or or something like that in a particular region, you could clamp down on price gouging in brick and mortar stores in that area. And that was a, a fairly effective practice. As we've seen now with COVID and climate change causing an increasing number of regional uh, climate disasters, such as the Western wildfires, disasters are no longer regional in nature. They're national and they're global. And also a lot of purchasing of consumer essential goods is no longer done at the brick and mortar store down the road from your house. It's done online on platforms such as Amazon. And so the current patchwork of state price gouging regulation is just woefully under-equipped to deal with how modern consumer goods are bought and sold, particularly in the wake of emergencies and disasters. And so this is something that I think we could really get bipartisan support for. It's not a particularly contentious issue that we don't want you know, people paying hundreds of dollars for toilet paper or hand sanitizer. And once again, you know, large sellers like Amazon are not exactly the most sympathetic entities right now. And so once again, I think we're going to see some potential action there. And surprisingly, a federal price gouging regulation is actually something that's even supported by some of the largest online selling platforms, because it's much easier to comply from their perspective as they build it into their pricing algorithms with just a single federal law rather than just a patchwork of many different state provisions. And so this is something that I'm uh, optimistic for. If the Biden-Harris transition team or in a couple of weeks, the administration, whether from the White House or one of the federal agencies or folks from the 117th Congress were to come to you and say, 
you know, what advice do you have for us? What would you recommend that we do in the area of consumer protection and finance? What might you tell them, Chris? So the first thing uh, I would uh, tell them to do, I think the first thing that they ought to do, is that the new comptroller should immediately begin the process of repealing the so-called true lender rule that was recently finalized and that gives essentially a blanket no accountability blessing to the partnering of what are really high cost online payday lenders who partner with these very small sort of out of the way banks that hold national charters and do this in order to export triple digit interest rates to borrowers in states where those sorts of interest rates are illegal if these online firms, these online fintechs were to make them. It doesn't look like the FDIC, even under McWilliams, is going to issue a complementary true lender rule based upon some some recent interviews and reporting, but I would like to see the OCC scrap that as soon as possible. The other thing I would like to see moving over to the mortgage servicing piece is I would like to see the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau take a broader view of some of its statutory authority when it comes to non-bank mortgage servicers. And the reason why I say this is because a larger and larger portion of the mortgage loans out there in the United States are being serviced by these non-bank companies. In fact, a tremendous majority of the VA and FHA loans are now serviced by non-banks. And of course, that's significant because communities of color, first-time home buyers, low and moderate income households, they disproportionately receive their loans under the FHA and the VA program. But I'll even say, you know, half half-ish of the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgage loans are also serviced by non-banks. The significance of that is that non-bank financial firms are just finance companies that are thinly capitalized. They don't live in the same sort of social contract regulatory environment that banks do, and they are subject to incredible liquidity strain during economic downturns, which is exactly what they are subject to right now. And there's been a tremendous amount of reporting on this problem. And I am really concerned, as I was after 2008, as to what happens to homeowners in financial distress when they're calling up those servicers trying to do some sort of loan modification, some sort of loss mitigation. I'm concerned that they will be passed around, hung up on, have their servicing rights transferred, have to restart their applications, materials that are mailed get lost. Because these firms do not have the resources that are necessary to staff up and invest in the software and other infrastructure that is necessary to manage defaulted mortgage loans. So I think, unfortunately, we've not seen any significant movement by Congress and not by the states either, because non-banks are licensed by states. And there's not been enough movement by the states since the last financial crisis to show I think that they are the types of robust financial regulators that are needed for these national markets and tech firms offering financial services. So I would like to see the CFPB interpret some of their own statutory powers, UDAP and otherwise, to impose financial safety and soundness requirements on these non-bank firms as part of their examination process. Thank you. And Nitsan. So I agree with a lot of that. I would also like to see the CFPB broader its scope of operation. And I and I think that, you know, the fact that seven of the nine justices have left untouched basically all most aspects of the CFPB's operations means that, you know, they have the legitimacy and certainly under this administration to move ahead and address these issues and really tackle some of the problems that they had a harder time doing before. And I think uh, Chris really described well what should be you know, the order of priority. And there's a momentum. And another thing that I think is that you know, following some of the way that some of the banks have executed the Stimulus Act and the CARES Act, I think that another thing that I would try to do is figure out a better way to harness both traditional banks as well as financial technology companies and non-traditional financial service providers to really better express and collaborate with the government on economic inclusion 
And I think that we talk a lot about the you know monetary aspects of the banking system and the less so about how the financial industry and banks, bank-like entities need to also address and express the fiscal aspects of what the government wants to do. And, and I think now with COVID and in the way that the government's efforts were not necessarily always translated well in terms of you know operational success, I think there should be a, a way to kind of figure out a better motivation for economic inclusion and, and real financial inclusion. And I know that some of the financial technology companies pride themselves of doing so, and, and they do reach out to unbanked and underbanked populations, bringing them under the financial services umbrella, and that's great. But the, the way that they do so and the price that sometimes consumers pay is not always ideal. So I think that should be another item on the agenda. And then last but not least, we touched upon this a little bit earlier when we talked about the bipartisan support and the sentiment towards big tech. But I think there is a momentum here with both sides of the aisle looking to better protect consumers and manage or control more the power of the big tech companies. And and I think that momentum should continue and we should really figure out ways to better regulate the activities, certainly now that some of these bigger tech companies are making deeper entries into uh, the financial industry. Google recently announced of its upgraded Google Wallet features with a collaboration with all sorts of banks. And I, that's just one example. And I think we should really sort of use this momentum that has been built right now and kind of figure out better ways to regulate this as well. Thank you. And Spencer? I would have two pieces of advice. And both of these pieces actually cut across you know, multiple specific policy areas. The first one is that consumer protection issues don't look like what they looked like 10 to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we didn't have online retailers being able to dynamically discriminate against consumers on both price and terms in real time based on, you know, specific consumer information and data that they would have harvested on those individuals. And so when the Biden-Harris administration turns to consumer protection, they're going to need modern solutions for modern problems. And the way that they choose to approach many of the issues that we've highlighted here today, they need to be thinking of ways in which to approach these issues that both respond to the actual issues on the ground, but are also forward-looking to where are some of these technologies going in the next five to 10 years, and how can we potentially anticipate some of the problems that are going to arise and respond to them in advance so we don't end up in a situation like we're currently in where the technology and the business practices have just substantially outpaced the regulation. And then the, the second piece of advice is that Now is not the time to just be okay with small changes on the margins. I mean, yes, get the easy wins, go after the low-hanging fruit. I mean, a lot of those things are important, but now is also the time to think big. We are currently in the wake of the biggest public health crisis that we've seen in our lives, the biggest economic disaster Um, particularly for working Americans. And so this is not the time when we can just be okay with just small changes. We need big changes. And so I would really press the Biden-Harris administration to think big when it comes to consumer protection with rampant inequality and a massive public health and economic crisis. They've got a really tough job set out for them. But, you know, I think especially with a lot of the people they've been bringing into the administration thus far, they're more than equipped to handle these problems. But I would really impress upon them to think big and really try and take a long and lasting uh, solution to consumer finance issues. Thank you all for these predictions and prescriptions for the future. I wondered if you have any closing thoughts or words for our listeners or perhaps for each other. And I might start with Spencer this time. Yeah, I think my parting thought would basically just pick up where I just left off, which is I'm cautiously optimistic for consumer protection in the next four years. It's not a surprise or a secret that consumer protection has not been in a great place for the past four years. But honestly, it wasn't in a great place before that either. And so I really see these next four years, particularly as we hopefully start coming out of the COVID disaster as a true inflection point in consumer protection and consumer regulation. 
And like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic, but the work is going to be really challenging. But I, I do think that the Biden-Harris administration is more than up for the task. Nitsan, final thoughts? I agree. I think there's more awareness and transparency. People are talking about these issues. You hear about them in basically every single outlet and medium. And I think that the government is definitely looking like it's up for the task and interested in the right questions and contacting the right people and diversifying the characters, which is also extremely helpful and useful when engaging with consumer protection. And so I'm also optimistic and I'm looking forward to seeing how these things unfold because I think we're at a very crucial point in time and to get this right, and we need to do it now. Thank you. And Chris, final words. Well, it's difficult for me to say anything uh, in a more articulate fashion than Spencer and, and Nietzsche had said because I agree with them wholeheartedly. And I suppose the only small thing I will add as an overarching comment is that I hope that when the new administration approaches financial regulation, financial regulation of banks, financial regulation of non-banks, I hope that they do so from the point of view that the business of finance is essentially a public service. And the business itself is only possible because of the public support for it. And so that means when we think about regulating financial institutions of all stripes, we need to think not only about their safety and soundness, not only about the typical prudential concerns, and we need to think not only about consumer protection, right, disclosure, substantive terms, price, but we also need to think about access. And I think that really goes to what the past year has revealed, problems of inequality that have always existed and that we've always talked about, but we sort of think about them as discrete issues or we think about the topic as sort of a discrete concern when really it should be an animating concern across both prudential regulation and consumer protection regulation because I come back to the idea The business of finance is a public service. It is public oriented. And if it is not being conducted and regulated in service to all of the public, then uh, then we, we really need to rethink the way we operate these markets. And I hope the administration takes that view and does so aggressively, both in Congress and in the agencies. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their participation on this panel on consumer protection and finance. Excellent conversation. And I think it's going to be a great contribution to this Business Scholarship Podcast Symposium on Corporate and Financial Regulation in the Biden Administration. This panel has featured Christopher Odene, Needson Packin, and Spencer Williams. Chris, Needson, Spencer, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. Andrew Jennings.